Yeah, that, that's what it is. Oh, shit, I was right. Yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> oh, Damn. shit, I was right. <laughs> wow, fuck me. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down the Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Church Chung Sullivan. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered... We'll cover one and choose one for yourself. Please visit shatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie you take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, Watchmen, and coming up, it's Westworld Season 4. Find all the information and past episodes at shatpod.com slash TV. Finally, to hang out with us live all week long, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatpod.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing today? So, Gene, this week, our prolific supporter, Steve, is back again. And <laughs> Steve's got a spotted pass. Sometimes he picks movies we love. Sometimes he picks movies we hate. And this time, Steve asked us to go back to 1998 and review the American romantic comedy, The Wedding Singer. Hello, Shat Crew. It's hot hey, for Steve yay. calling in for Good Wedding Steve. Singer. I enjoyed <laughs> calling in the past three movies instead of emailing, so I'm going to keep that tradition going on every single podcast I commission from here on out. So, Wedding Singer, I scheduled this for my birthday week podcast. I think it's a week early on the schedule, but whatever. So it's for my birthday. Um, unlike the past couple ones, I do remember this movie. I haven't seen it in a while, but I remember most of the movie in general. I know I used to love it and get a bunch of laughs out of it. Hopefully it still holds up, but uh, another Adam Sandler movie for you guys, because there's a lack of them on the schedule. I commissioned most of them, Happy Gilmore and Wedding Singer, and I don't know if there's another one. Uh, but yeah, I did those two. So. <laughs> Hopefully it holds up well. Also, I'm going to compile um, an average of all the movies I commissioned to see where I stack. <laughs> so once I get through Liar Liar, I will put that list together and see how it stacks up. Have a great day, and uh, hopefully you enjoy Wedding Singer. Bye. Steve, I'm loving the energy on yeah. this one. It's not a competition to who gets the lowest white scores of all the commissioners. <laughs> also, your movie commissions are like my liquor cabinet where I open up and go, oh, that was in there? Shit. I remember getting that one. What do I have? Who knows? But it's always going to be fun. Don't forget also we had Dirty Work. He's in there, right? We eat the meat and together we burn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so he was. So thanks again, Steve. Well, The Wedding Singer is a romantic comedy released February 13th, 1998. It tells the story of a wedding singer in 1985 who falls in love with a server. Produced on a budget of $18 million, it grossed $123 million worldwide and received generally positive reviews from critics. It is often ranked as one of Adam Sandler's best comedies. The film was later adapted into a stage musical of the same name, debuting on Broadway in April 2006 and closing on New Year's Eve of that same year. John Lovitz would reprise his role as Jimmy Moore in the episode of the same name of The Goldbergs, which was a sitcom if you never watched it, set during the events of The Wedding Singer with Adam Sandler, Drew Barrymore, and Billy Idol appearing through use of archival footage. So Big D Ash, we always ask the question, where were you and what are your memories of the movie we're covering? Today it is The Wedding Singer. Ash, what do you got? So I'm not a fan of the romantic comedy genre. That is not a movie that I'm going to like pick out of the list of movies on Fandango to go and see at the movie theater. But uh, as I have stated in uh, multiple episodes, I'm a massive fan of Adam Sandler. And 
even I can admit that the combination of like he and Drew Barrymore, they're precious. They've got really cute little chemistry. And for me, the best part about this movie is that it's set in the 80s. So I have a sibling that's 12 years older than me. And I worshipped all things 80s growing up because I thought she was like the absolute coolest thing that ever existed. So her decade to me was obviously the coolest too. And so it was it was something that was just like kind of nostalgia for me. And so I saw this movie in the movie theater. I've seen it many times since. This is one of the ones that I I think I could have reviewed without going back and watching it. I mean, I did because I believe in the work of the pod, but I've seen this one multiple times. Do people still use Fandango? That's a thing? No, but back then in 98, we did. Oh, okay. The Palace Theater in New Orleans, Palace 16. Well, this movie came out during what I thought were the best days of my life. I was 17. I was in my senior year of high school. I was in love and I was crazy about whatever the fuck it was Adam Sandler was doing on screen. And this movie took all that, then touched on my 80s nostalgia. Like you, Ash, I have a cousin who's 12 years older, and I was obsessed with everything he was obsessed with. I thought George Michael was super cool. I thought like Wham was super cool. Depeche Mode, rest in peace, Fletch. My love of 80s music, my love of 80s nostalgia, and my wildly romantic teen hormones made this like the perfect movie at the perfect time. And while I was purging my garage before moving in with Sarah, I had to get rid of a ton of CDs. As I was going through them, there was the Wedding Singer soundtrack. And man, I listened to that thing like a million fucking times. It was one of the hardest things to let go. So as the oldest member of the podcast, I found myself wondering recently, were the 80s really that good? As somebody yeah. who lived through it, mm-hmm. looking back and all the things that you remember were great, but I don't know that they were. It's, and this movie kind of got me questioning that. You know, Do we remember just the highlights? Just, oh, the DeLorean, just the movies, just the neon outfits. I don't know that it was great. As far as Adam Sandler, I have admitted before I was late to the party I don't remember really watching any of his movies, I think, until it was either like Waterboy or Happy Gilmore. And then I went back. But Adam Sandler had a string there where he was everywhere and everything like from, let's say, 98 back to 94. There was like Billy Madison, Airheads. There was uh, Happy Gilmore. There was The Wedding Singer, Dirty Work He Had a Part In, The Waterboy, Big Daddy. Like he was everywhere. But I just, for some reason, never saw his stuff. You know, this came out my senior year in college. I don't remember going to the theater to see it because usually Adam Sandler movies weren't worth the time or the investment of the money when you really didn't have it because his movies were always, to me, a, a late night, a blockbuster rental, multiple friends sitting around and watching it. But it wasn't worth the investment because I never knew it was going to really be that good. So this one, I don't think I saw it until years later. What's crazy about the amount of movies he put out in such a short amount of time is Adam Sandler, like Daniel Day-Lewis, I mean, he just became a totally different person for each movie. Like, you wouldn't even know it was Adam Sandler until you saw his (laughs) name in the credits. I mean, talk about a method actor. This guy. (laughs) Zippity-doo! Let's jump back to 1985 and hit the trailer. Before the internet. Before cell phones, before rollerblades, there was a time. Everybody on the dance floor. Very nice, Grandma Molly. When Robbie Hart was the most popular wedding singer around. You spin me right round, baby, right round. Like a record, baby, right round, round, round. Hey, somebody get some pants on that kid. Until he got stood up at his own wedding. I woke up this morning and I realized I'm about to marry a wedding singer? Once again, things that could have been brought to my attention yesterday! New Line Cinema presents... Is it true that you're in the middle of a nervous breakdown? Robbie Hart is a New Jersey wedding singer in 1985, preparing to marry his fiance Linda. He befriends Julia Sullivan, a new server at the reception hall where he works, and promises to sing at her wedding to bond investor Glenn Gulia. On Robbie's wedding day, his sister Kate informs him Linda has changed her mind about the wedding, leaving him humiliated. Linda tells Robbie she fell in love with him for his ambitions of being a rock star, not a wedding singer. Robbie sinks into depression, and his best friend Sammy convinces him to return to work. Julia convinces him to help her plan her wedding. So right off the bat, this movie feels very, very different from the Adam Sandler movies we've seen in the past. I mean, we covered Happy Gilmore for this podcast. We're all big Billy Madison fans, Ash especially. 
those movies, if you watch them, they're funny from the jump. They get right to the jokes and the jokes hit. The Wedding Singer, it starts with this like musical number where he's singing Dead or Alive. And during the opening credits, you get these tired sight gags that just don't hit. The jokes are overall like meaner. They're less creative and they lack that certain magic that we got from Happy Gilmore and Billy Madison. Not that those movies were all sunshine and rainbows, but they felt different. They weren't as cruel. Adam Sandler co-wrote Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore with Tim Herlihy, right? So they were a writing team. On this one, you'll note Sandler isn't on the writing credits. And I can feel that barrier between the art and the artist. It just doesn't feel like it's 100% an Adam Sandler movie. I know you joked about you know Adam Sandler being the, the modern Daniel Day Lewis or the Daniel Day Lewis of comedy. There's a formula to his movies. He is usually the lovable loser, even if it's Billy Madison and he comes from money. He's the goofball. He's the one people make fun of here. I'm not being like social justice warrior, but I could feel it. He was like mean in the opening sequence. You got that fat lady like licking the cake. And then you got multiple jokes about the fat dude and having a heart attack. There's a tone in this movie that's different. A lot of his movies feel like they flow organically. This, it was forced. Some of the jokes, it was cringe, where we get the the old woman, Rose, is paying him in meatballs. I'm like, okay, that's cute. And then she's like, put out your hands. And she's making him eat it out of his hands, and they're smushing it. It was, it, it was a bit forced to me. Yeah, he lives in the basement. Yeah, he drives a shitty car. Yeah, he doesn't make much money, and he's like a nice guy. But it, it looks like he's tolerating everybody around him instead of celebrating them. I don't know. I mean, I think that you guys may be misremembering like other Adam Sandler films. I wouldn't exactly call them nice. Like, I don't think that his humor is like incredibly nice in other movies. And more so than anything, like, I think Robbie's a fine guy. I think he's a guy in a job that he doesn't want. And I think that's what comes across in this movie. I don't think it's necessarily like him hating on other people, but he could have been a much bigger dick than he is because he's like a failed <laughs> rock star and working, you know, at a banquet hall which has to be like you know your worst nightmare if you actually want to be a rock star so robbie's fine I, I don't know that he's fine i'll get into it later where i kind of dissect his character but one of the things that he does here that he normally doesn't do is there's a dark turn i'm not enjoying it like gene as it's opening but i'm saying okay let's see where this goes but robbie thankfully takes this descent really quick you know when when the wedding is called off when he's He's devastated, and he goes into a dark place. Sammy, some reason, convinces him to go back to work, which probably is not the best idea you could do. And he's at Cindy and Scott's wedding, and he's performing the saddest version of Madonna's holiday. Let's celebrate. <laughs> and he's got custom lyrics with, like, holiday, celebrate, everybody spread the word. I live in my sister's base. And I'm, I was laughing. I thought it was really funny. And I'm like, okay, we're going to take this turn. He gets into a fight with like the father of the bride. He does a version of Love Stinks, which I was like, eh, whatever I can deal with. But then thankfully, thankfully, he started to heal. We get him singing that song to Julia that he warns her and says, I've been listening to The Cure a lot at the point when I wrote this. And he's performed Somebody Kill Me. And I'm like, fuck yes. I'm all in on the Dark Sandler. Yeah, I mean, deranged Sandler is always better than like happy in a relationship guy. It's why movies like eventually what he would do with Drew Barrymore, like that movie Blended, which is utterly horrific. You know, in that movie, it's because of the fact that he never gets deranged at all, even though his wife died of ovarian cancer and he should have like an even like sadder story than he does in this movie. But it's in that scene where you can see like the Adam Sandler of old and the yeah. rest of it is like what the Adam Sandler like of the, you know, 2000s would become which is like the mom friendly adam sandler because you can see a little bit of like that billy madison you can see a little bit of that happy gilmore there and the performance of that song is the highlight of the the whole movie <laughs> i still laughed out loud when he starts you know going back and forth between the happy parts and he sings you know pull a bullet in my head and he's just screaming it and you've got john lovitz you know in the you know the curtains watching him you know and celebrating the fact that his business <laughs> is going to go up because robbie's is clearly going to go down i mean this is by far the best part of the movie. The story isn't funny. Like the script isn't particularly good. What we have is funny people who are propping up a sappy romance. And sadly, like you said, Ash, this gave us a preview of what Adam Sandler's movies would be like post 90s. Like not movies that he was in, but his catalog, right? Where he was the star. 
And if you think of the funniest moments in this movie, it's not Steve Buscemi's like speech. It's it's when he's falling off the back steps. He goes, hey, wedding singer. <laughs> and then just drops a glass. That's funny. Or when Alan Covert, Sammy, when he's like, they were cones. And that's it, right? It's just a non sequitur. These are guys making magic out of nothing. Yes. And I think this is the same as dirty work. We remember the funny moments, but the funny moments are far between. Steve Buscemi is gold when he's giving the best man speech and he talks, you know, listen, pop, Harold's at that perfect. And he talks about the prostitutes in Puerto Rico, but not remembering that he fucking that they paid for them. There's funny moments. I think it's really good. And, and there's a couple of times I found myself get caught off balance where Julia goes to her mom. And says, Mom, what do I do? I need some advice. And you think the mother's going to give some wise, sage advice about romance and loving her father. And she says, well, uh, faking a pregnancy works. I, I thought some of the moments worked, but on a, on a whole, it didn't it didn't blend together. Yeah. And I think it's because this isn't a comedy. This is a romantic comedy, which is a different type of comedy, mm, right? We're okay. like, there's a reason okay. why romantic comes first, because the love story is clearly what they prioritize in this movie. And I think you have to almost watch this film without Adam Sandler being factored into it because it isn't his type of comedy at, at all. It's meant to be that turn in his career where somebody, you know, said, okay, here's this goof that's kind of weird looking that dudes really like, some girls really like too. And let's kind of make him into like the charming, slightly ugly, but relatable guy that girls will want to date. And the plot's dumb because romantic comedy plots are are dumb. And I think the only reason it works is because he does end up being charming, which I was very surprised by the first time I saw this. And Drew Barrymore. I mean, I think that a lot of people talk about Sandler in this movie, but like if it weren't for Drew Barrymore, if a lesser actress is like playing his love interest, this would have been impossible to watch. But she is likable. I, I think you can't help but like her. I think she's a really charming actress. And I think the two of them together are fine, but it isn't a comedy. I could help but like her. I was getting yeah. like a Juliet Lewis vibe from her. She Aww. she almost seemed like she had like a brain injury. <laughs> yes. I kept thinking of Fifty First Dates. I thought she was a bit slow. She had this dopey smile and she was like, okay. Like everything she kind of tolerated. I didn't think there was anything particularly likable about her other than she wasn't mean. She was like vanilla ice cream. Like a big bowl of vanilla ice cream. Sure, it's good. But after like two spoonfuls, I'm like, can we get some some sprinkles or some toppings on this? Oh, no, I think she's cute. Her entire dialogue could have been replaced with, oh, Ravi, you're funny. <laughs> Ravi, ha, Ravi. <laughs> well, during a double date, Ravi learns from Glenn that he cheats on Julia frequently. When Holly tells Ravi that Julia is marrying Glenn for his money, Ravi unsuccessfully pursues a job at a bank. Julia is dismayed at Ravi's materialism, and he accuses her of the same. Depressed, he decides to follow Sammy's example of only having shallow relationships with women. Meanwhile, Julia confides in her mother that she has fallen out of love with Glenn and has developed feelings for Robbie. Robbie sees her through her bedroom window in her wedding dress where she is pretending she has just married Robbie, but Robbie assumes she is thinking of Glenn. So, Ash, I'm going to, for the rest of this review, I'm going I'm to take what you said to heart. Don't look at this like a comedy. Dumb it down a bit because yeah. it's a romantic comedy, okay? Because I mentioned in the intro that as a kid of the 80s, I lived through it. And I get bothered with a lot of movies that, that seem to hit only the high notes. Like now we seem to have gotten better at things like Stranger Things that are telling you and showing you the 80s in the way that I remember the little <laughs> bits that like what life was like instead of like this movie. They only focus. Yeah, OK, we get some neon, but it's like the big ticket. Hey, let's trigger a memory. CD players, they're brand new and 700 bucks. You get Sammy wearing a Michael Jackson red leather jacket and the glove. He even fucking moonwalks. You know, Holly's got to play with a Rubik's Cube and throw it down on the table because she's frustrated. And Glenn drives a DeLorean. He's got the Miami Vice theme. You know, Andy's watching the climax of Dallas, the cliffhanger where JR gets shot. Forget the fact that that was 1980 and not 1985. I don't know why he was so invested in a show that was five years old. But it, it's, it took me out of it, and it felt like these were just the highlights, the cliff notes of the 80s. 
And it didn't make me think this was the 80s. It just made me think, hey, this is Adam Sandler with a bad wig pretending to be in the 80s. Okay, so like I don't disagree with you about this movie, but Stranger Things, I mean, Stranger Things is one of the most heavy handed, like clear, like nostalgia porn examples that's like out there. And don't get me wrong, I like the show. I think it's a good show, but it is certainly not subtle. And I have a personal like vendetta against it that like it has has brought like Dungeons and Dragons into the forefront. And like it's now this kitschy thing that people are playing that like don't understand the importance of that game, but whatever, it's fine. But it is not subtle. And this movie isn't either. And, and I think that you you hit all of the important points, but the style is where it's the most egregious for me. Because Julia, she has some okay clothes. Like she's got some clothes that like I feel like I have in my closet today. Like that outfit she's wearing with those Doc Martens, like when she brings the sheet music. Like she looks fairly normal in this movie, but not compared to the other people. You've got her cousin who's like this like crazy Madonna wannabe. You already mentioned the Michael Jackson stuff, the rolled up sleeves. Like, come on. The skin any ties oh my god that's where it ended for me and the guy in the relax shirt like frankie mm-hmm. goes to hollywood but we don't need to be like hey relax don't do it just show me the fucking shirt hold on hold on this was 1998 and in, in my recollection this is like the first time we saw an 80s nostalgia comedy they were breaking ground here it was mm-hmm. something new people didn't even think to do this i think prior to this movie but like stranger things for me what i really love is the way that the houses look the carpet the kitchens, the little subtle things in the house really ring true to me. If you really want a great example of the uh, of nostalgia done right, uh, Wet Hot American Summer. Yeah. That's fucking perfect. Agreed. Do you know that almost all of his big movies fall within about four or five minutes different in length? They're all 90 to 95 minutes of runtime. That is the sweet zone that his movies work. And I can't believe I'm saying this because we always complain about movies going too long. I wanted a little bit more time. I think this movie feels rushed. They have so much they're trying to accomplish, maybe because it's the romantic comedy and it's not, I'm just going to save grandma's house or, hey, I'm going to play football and win the big game. There's some complexity here with his life, his career, love, his family, issues that are going on you know, in his head about has his worth. I would have wanted a couple more minutes because I don't think the movie is served by the short running time. He's had this 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 epiphany where Holly tells him everybody cares about money, Robbie. You have to think about providing. He goes in the very same day. Robbie quits his job with Rosie. He's no longer making meatballs. He goes into the city. He's trying to get a job. He's wearing a suit and he tells people, I want to make money. I want to live in a nice house with wide windows. Either spend some time letting Robbie come to this or just don't put it in there. Cut it out because there's some pieces in between that make the character's actions seem more believable. I would never ask for a longer Adam Sandler movie, but I don't disagree with you, Big D. Because I also don't normally sit and ask questions. Usually the answer is because the movie said so. Just fucking go with it, right? But at some point, you got to hold up a hand and scream, like, why? Like, why does Robbie agree to go on a double date with Julia and Holly? That sounds like the worst fucking idea. Like, you you like this woman. You're going to go on a double date with her sister and her fiance? That's Why would you do that? <laughs> why does Glenn... Tell Robbie, who is Julia's friend and Holly's date, that he cheats on Julia. It seems like a really fucking stupid thing to do if you're about to get married. Why is 23-year-old Drew Barrymore attracted to 32-year-old Adam Sandler, who is a wedding singer? I don't know. Why do both of them demonstrate the emotional maturity and communication skills of a fucking 10-year-old? And I feel like John Hughes films, which are not particularly good at this, gave us more insight and explanation to the characters than, than the wedding singer. But maybe, as you said, Big D, 20 more minutes runtime explaining this shit would really help. Or it could just be like every other romantic comedy because like that movie I got sucked into watching You've Got Mail the other day, which talk (laughs) about like anachronistic of like watching a movie based off that type of like email. But that movie doesn't make any fucking sense either. But I I have to say the one thing that 
got me in this movie is that scene. And I hate that you guys, that said a reminder of Ju- Juliet Lewis. Cause Oh, I love Drew Barrymore, but she's in that scene where she's standing in front of the mirror and it's that classic romantic comedy scene, right? Where there's a misunderstanding that causes everything to go off track before obviously and predictably it gets back on track again by the end of the film. I do think this scene is okay because of Drew Barrymore. And like, I was sitting there going, man, I cannot imagine going into my wedding, like being worried about whether or not I was making the right choice, whether or not like this was a good decision or not. And I have friends that I've sat with them, like in the room that you wait in after everybody's dressed and pictures are done and like they're getting ready to walk out there and they just like get completely wasted because they are so nervous about it or they throw up because they're so fucking nervous about walking down the aisle. And I could have never gotten married without being a 100% sure. And I was never keen on the idea of marriage that I was surprised when I decided to do it, like how much it actually mattered to me. And I mean, not the ceremony itself, but like the act of like doing it. And like Tom and I wound up getting married at the courthouse, like in private, Nobody knew about it in December before our big wedding in March because we wanted something like just for us so we could take it seriously. And I think that's the problem is a lot of people want the wedding. They don't want like the actual marriage because weddings are fun. Marriages like 60% of the time aren't. So like Big D, you're the only other married person on the pod. Like were you nervous before the big day or like Jean, do you know friends who were like super like freaked out about getting married? No, I don't know why people were looking forward to getting married. I used to joke in the army with my roommate, (laughs) Eric. uh, We used to say marriage is a prison. Why would you do that? You would never get (laughs) married. Why would you limit yourself and say, okay, for the rest of my life, I'm going to have this one specific meal every day. But then (laughs) you I'm so sorry, Vanessa. (laughs) No, no, you got to let me finish. But then you meet the person. Yeah. I got married to Vanessa at the courthouse literally seven months after I met her. Oh, my God. Because she was the first time I didn't want to fuck up. She was the first time that I thought of something other than myself and tried to do the right thing. So there were multiple junctions where I could have gone the wrong way and sabotaged it, but I didn't because there was something different about her. So I didn't dream about weddings every day and, oh, I can't wait for it because you're setting yourself up that that's the end goal. Marriages are hard. Marriages are a lot of work. But I will remember we got married in Brazil a couple of years after the courthouse with all of our friends and family. I've talked about it. The day after we got married, her and I had this gigantic fight. And I said to her, I said, I don't fucking even know why we just did this. I know we're not going to last. Whoa. <gasps> oh, my God. Fast forward. It's now almost 19 years. And that's because it's work. It's yeah. it's never going to be. People think, oh, we're married. It's going to be beautiful and great. Fuck no. That's when the work starts. Because for a lot of people, that's their end goal. And what's next? You know, I've I've climbed to the top of the mountain. What do I do? You got to constantly work at it, people. And you got to nurture it like it's a little baby tree and help it grow. Here's my advice to all the young people out there. The Big D Kids Club. All the youths that listen to this podcast. <laughs> all those 20-somethings, teenagers going into college this year. Mary old. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because it's awesome, dude. Like, I'm 42 now, yeah. and uh, I'm just like, okay, yeah, I've seen all the shit. I figured it all out. Cool. Yeah. All right. And listen, if you're wrong, you'll die soon, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> i give you two thumbs think- up. When exactly like all 42 old, but yeah, I mean, I didn't get married till 30 for that exact, that exact reason. Like getting married at like in your twenties. I cannot fucking imagine that. I cannot fathom no. that there's so much, no. you have so much left to no. figure out. You know, I didn't know how I wanted to dress when I was in my twenties. Kids also wait longer than you think you should, because it's great now. Like when my friends are out downtown sending me drunk pics, I'm like, fuck no, I'd rather be on the couch with Emma watching Encanto for the 30th time. So make sure you've completed and done everything. You don't regret it and feel held back by the kid because then you will start to uh, resent it. Okay, counterpoint though. If you weren't married with a child, you could be watching Encanto on the couch with me. I like that. Well, we, we could do that after we go to Justin Bieber's wedding together. I just found out yesterday. Uh-huh. He's the best man. Fuck yes, oh my God. motherfucker. <laughs> I tell you, I'm going to get, I'm going to (laughs) make Sarah get sick. So you have to take me. I mentioned it to Emma. I said, Hey, Emma, should I go to a wedding if I could with Justin Bieber? She goes, what? Where? Where? What? Who's going? Where? She was all about it. So if you don't want to take me, Emma will go with you in a heartbeat. I'm sorry. How does Emma know who Justin Bieber is? He's all over the radio. You kidding me? I'm living with the ghost of you or even all the new songs. Oh, yeah. See, I don't listen to the radio. Bieber's on point. 
Yeah. My kid can sing <laughs> Joy Division, so that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. That's cool. Uh, well, the other thing that this movie, I think, does do well is it sheds a light on what started happening in the 80s, which was like the birth of the wedding industrial complex. Like that is something that began in the 80s and that has just ballooned completely out of control thanks to Pinterest and Instagram and all of those crazy apps. Here's the deal. Planning a wedding is like a fucking full-time job. It costs so much money and I've never understood even after having gotten married, like for what? Because it's a party. But, like, it's a very regimented party where, like, we've all decided somewhere along the way that, like, these, like, five things are supposed to happen and you're supposed to have these things done. And so you have to pay these companies to have these traditions happen or it's not like a real wedding. And our wedding, I refuse to let my dad go into debt for our wedding because that's fucking stupid. And so we did most of our wedding ourselves. We spent the majority of the money on food because, hello, New Orleans. But, like, even doing that, our wedding was still over $25,000. Oh, Jesus. So, like... It's insane. And I think this movie does do a good job of showing how ridiculous the whole like shindig is. I do have a question about this because as we're watching the movie, I admittedly, I'm not an expert on weddings and how they go down. Glenn tells Julia whatever she wants for the wedding, like it's up to her. He doesn't want to be involved in the planning of it. I thought that was standard. I thought that the groom is like, yeah, man, like it's your wedding. Do whatever no. the fuck you want. Is that not the no. case? No, no. You should be an active participant, yeah. but in the end, you got to take a back seat. You're there basically to support, but in the end, it's because. But like, it's your wedding too. I didn't give a shit. Like Vanessa picked fucking purple as the color. She regrets it to this day, but I don't have a preference. I don't care. It was. I was never as a like, little boy being like, "Wow, I can't wait to have fucking blue floral arrangements." It wasn't like that. So I let her do what what makes her happy. Yeah, I think in my family, the standard for the guys, at least for my dad's side, I'm talking about car, house, where you live, pets, whatever. It's all it's all the woman's choice. Like the dude is just we're like little worker. It's a drone. Yeah. You know, my job is to just inhabit the space and like do what is asked of me and a little more. And that's it. Well, well, they say happy wife, happy life. That doesn't come out of fucking thin air. It's a, it's a saying that people do. I thought it was a fortune cookie. But that's like also <laughs> such a sexist saying. Like, I think that like, here's the deal. Like marriage, two people are getting married. And like, I didn't grow up dreaming about my wedding. I didn't think about what my wedding was going to look like. So when we decided to get married, it was like, okay, where do you want to get married? Like, where are we going to get married? Like what represents like us as a couple? And so we got married on the Ides of March. So we had a whole pamphlet about how to sacrifice sheep correctly on the Ides of March. Like, you know, we did shit that was like very indicative of like Tom and I, not like what I wanted, but like what we decided together. So somebody's got to be in charge and somebody's got to be support. It makes it a lot easier. I'm a big fan of whether it's trips. Yes. Yes. Remodeling anything. I'm like one person plan the thing. The other person go with it. It makes life way fucking easier. But there's a reason why Julia looks so disappointed. And it's because like most people, people that are getting married like they want their partner to care about like all of that too so like she's disappointed for a reason well if ash i don't want to spoil this but if glenn had acted like he was you know involved in picking out place settings and and the meal and where to do the 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 arrangement of the seats he would have been faking it right but because glenn didn't care about her like that was the whole point like tom was highly involved in the planning of our wedding because like it was his wedding too and he wasn't going to have us do something that was like dumb Final thing here, my little piece of advice to listeners out there, uh, do a low cost wedding, do yes. something where you can enjoy it. Vanessa and I got married after, uh, it was, I think two and a half years after our ceremony at the courthouse, ironically, hurricane Katrina weekend in Brazil, we had our friends fly in our family. Granted, we were helped by the exchange rate, but we probably spent $5,000 and we told our friends just show up, but there would never be another time in my life that my relatives from Sweden from New York, my friends, family would all be on the edge of the Amazon. So do something special you'll remember because the day goes by in a blur and you'll have nothing to show for. Ash, as a New Orleanian, how do you feel about the phrase Hurricane Katrina weekend? <laughs> I know that my camera is off for today's recording, but what you missed was a massive eye roll. <laughs> so- 
<laughs> hey kids, it's Hurricane Katrina weekend. Let's go. Woo. Yeah, in between rehearsals and the ceremony, we had CNN International on and we were watching Jesus it. Christ. I swear. But w- what was ironic enough was Cole Pickock and a bunch of other guests almost got caught in Miami because of the storm. Oh, how sad. We were losing everything oh. we owned. <laughs> Oh. It would have ruined my weekend, Ash. You and your little storm. <sighs> Ash, losing everything you own is a terrible way to celebrate Hurricane Katrina weekend. <laughs> I know. I, we should have more fucking fun than that. I think we should also call, like, you know, all of these horrible natural disasters. Like, oh, hey, it's the great fire of 1776 weekend. Like, no. I mean, like, come on. Hey, Fuck kids, you. are you ready for 9-11 week? <laughs> <laughs> Well, heartbroken, Robbie leaves to get drunk and finds Glenn arm in arm with another woman. After a heated exchange, Glenn punches Robbie and mocks him. Robbie stumbles home to find Linda waiting for him, wanting to reconcile, and he passes out. The following morning, Linda answers the door in Robbie's Van Halen t-shirt and introduces herself as his fiance to a crestfallen Julia. Julia runs to Glenn and tells him she wants to be married immediately. He half-heartedly offers to take her to Vegas. We've talked about this kind of at length, but, you know, Sandler, he may do different types of movies, but a lot of his shtick remains the same. Like his acting chops, especially in this time, he had like these pockets where he was comfortable. But here, he is different than the other films we've seen him in. Like from the start, like if you didn't know who Adam Sandler was, like you wouldn't know what kind of an actor he is. And as I said already, he's kind of charming in a lot of ways where he's hilarious, but he's also kind of gross and like peeing his pants to make a kid feel good about themselves or, you know, hanging out and eating snack packs all day. That's not exactly the most attractive qualities and a man. But the thing I'm always really surprised by in this movie is how well like Sandler can actually sing. And I know that he does musical numbers on SNL and he's got his Hanukkah song and like the whole, you know, phone keys, whatever wallet thing he did. And, you know, during the pandemic and the Chris Farley song, we can hear it kind of, but when he does the musical numbers in this movie, like the dude can really fucking sing. Like he's actually got a really great voice and it works in this movie and it makes it more believable than if he were just somebody that was like dubbed. But that sensitive voice he does in this movie, it's so gross. Like, could you imagine <laughs> talking to a grown man who talks like that? No. I was like, like, Ash, how does it make you feel as a woman? I mean, I think it's more addictive of him just not knowing how to act. It's like when people try to do like the sad voice and they're like, oh, Hurricane Katrina weekend is coming, guys. And I just don't know what to do about it. Like, you know, it, it's not like a real. That sounds like a horny voice. It does. It's not like a real voice. That voice, it fits Robbie's character. Robbie is a loser. Okay, Glenn. Robbie at every turn, he takes the choice that is the easy way out. Can he improve his life? No, no, I'm fine. I'm going to live in my sister's basement. It's okay. I'm going to keep my job, you know, that I particularly, I don't really like it, but. He settles for friends that he clearly thinks are beneath him when he's presented with a difficult situation, right? He now loves Julia. She's this great person. Even if she doesn't love you, you do the right thing. You confront Glenn. You tell him, come clean to Julia or I will. Man up. I hate to say that, but stand up for what's right. But instead, beta Robbie, he cowers, he kowtows, he remains silent. He then lets Glenn embarrass him in public to where some like hobo, some homeless, like, like old drunk, tries to come protect him, it, it, it's bad. Julia deserves a better partner who's going to stand up for her in the hard times because Robbie is just going to sit there and whine. You can't solve every problem, you know, no matter how talented he is, Ash, with a well-timed parody song. Big D, you mentioned that Robbie settles for friends that he feels are beneath him. And I want to focus on that because Robbie isn't the most likable Adam Sandler character. Like he's no Happy Gilmore. He's no Bobby Boucher. He's no Billy Madison. And part of that, as we've kind of touched on, is he isn't a real underdog, right? You talk about Billy Madison. He had a critical flaw. He was a man who struggled to outgrow his childhood. Happy Gilmore, he was like this surly hockey player, but he had to learn responsibility and change the golf world and, and you know, and save his grandma's house. <laughs> Bobby Boucher was from Louisiana. They all fit in (laughs) with major flaws and they embrace the misfits around them. But Robbie, you're right. He looks down on Sammy. He looks down on fat people. He looks down on George, his keyboardist. He looks down on old Rosie. He's overall a pretty nice guy, but he lacks the charm of a true outcast. 
Oh, he's a fucking dick. Sammy has this moment where he opens up, you know, because dudes, a lot of times we have a hard time showing emotion to our friends and he really reveals himself where, you know, he, Robbie's now, oh, I'm going to be like you, different woman every day. It's going to be great. We're going to we're going to do it together. And he says, you know what? He says, I'm miserable. He says, I'm alone. I want somebody to hold me. I want to know everything's going to be okay. This is a vulnerable moment. Sammy has stepped outside. He's like to quote The Bachelor. He's let his walls down. He's <laughs> trusting. And what the fuck does Robbie do? He uses this information to blackmail fucking Sammy into paying for his ticket to Vegas. You're just being funny there. Like, I mean, <laughs> I don't think that that was that big of a deal. And again, I don't know if I would call Billy Madison or Happy Gilmore likable. I think they're fucking hilarious. But if we knew them in real life, I think they would drive me insane because they're kind of immature. Like a guy that's, you know, cursing at a golf ball and throwing shit all the time is not, you know, necessarily a guy that like you want out with you at the bar because he's always going to be starting fights. But I don't know. I think Robbie, he's a nice enough guy. I don't think he looks down on George or Rosie. I just think he sees them for what they are. And Rosie's an older lady and she, you know, old people sometimes are kind of annoying. They're precious and they're wonderful, but they're kind of annoying. And George, you know, he sees him as just kind of this weird dude that only learns one song and he understands that he, you know, is still looking for his place in the world. And it just is what it is. No, I disagree. <laughs> That's it. This is your rebuttal. No, <laughs> you're wrong. My rebuttal is I, no, no. I, 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 I think you know what it is. The difference is the, the, there's some growth in the other characters. We see them all strive. They try to become better. People around them rally around them. Here, it's not. It's just. It's. I, I hate to fucking like be the fucking downer, but Robbie sucks, and he drags people down his rabbit hole of miserable existence. He has people around him that are as stuck as he is. And here's the deal. The thing that Robbie Hart does that like Happy Gilmore or Billy Madison would never do is he admits when he's wrong. Like when Julia brings him the sheet music and he's an absolute tool to her, he looks at it and he goes, oh my God, you're such an asshole. Like he realizes like the shit he's doing that's not okay. He realizes he needs to get out of his sister's basement. He's at least self-aware in a way that the others aren't. Okay, but why does the movie have to pick on Linda? <laughs> like Linda in this movie, they're like, oh, she's a psycho. She's a bitch. But yeah. is she really like Linda's right about Robbie as Big D has made an excellent case for like he has changed as a person. At one point, he was trying to be a rock star. Now he's a wedding singer that lives in his sister's basement. He's not that hot rocker. He once was. He's content being in this small town. He's content being broke. And she recognizes that. And goes, wait, this is not what I fucking signed up for. So I think she does the right thing by standing him up at the wedding. Like, yes, as he mentions, the information would have been better, you know, yesterday. But eventually she comes back to Robbie. She's trying to work it out. And listen, it's not a good idea to get married to somebody if you are having your doubts. Also, most importantly, Linda is way fucking hotter than Julia Gulia, who, by the way, cheats on her fiance. Yeah, with Robbie, fucking dirtbag. You see, it's proof he's a fuck. Billy Madison would never kiss How an engaged woman. How did she cheat on him? She kisses him. Oh, my God. I know that you are not calling that kiss cheating. What? She oh, knew what whatever. she was doing with that kiss. Are you fucking kidding That's me? Slut. Hold on, hold on. Prudes. If you were engaged to be married and you walked in with a brand new CD player and Tom had just been kissing his friend that was helping him shop for wedding stuff. Just tongue and mm. You wouldn't be like, Tom, mm. that's cheating. I, I don't think that kissing's cheating, no. But oh, anyway. great. Okay, okay. Well, hopefully Tom is off not cheating right now and kissing somebody. Trust Which me, you do later, Tom Ash. isn't kissing anybody. So, <laughs> oh, I can guarantee that. But. but Gene, you deserve an answer here. You know, Linda should much better. Fuck no. Linda can't be trusted. Linda can't be your ride or die. Because she does not have a problem walking away. And again, I want ownership. I want people to be strong enough to say how they feel. Linda, walk up to Robbie at the wedding and say, hey, sorry, everybody. This was a mistake. Let's let's own it. Let's fucking everybody have a party here. But this isn't the right thing for either of us. She lacks respect for, for Robbie, both families, and she's going to do it again. Anyone who doesn't have the courage to show up on her wedding day is going to disappear on Robbie again when shit gets hard. Linda's an asshole. 
Like, I cannot imagine anyone leaving someone at the altar. Like, it's the ultimate disrespect. And she, I don't think she's hot as Julie, because I don't think she's hot. Like, I think she's weird looking. And it may just be that wig they have on her. But I think Drew Barrymore is beautiful beautiful in this movie. And again, she leaves him at the fucking altar. She's an asshole. Uh, She may be an asshole, but Gene, I agree. I would rather sleep with Linda. Linda would be fun. Linda's crazy. Linda's wild. Drew Barrymore, you know, she would just have that fucking shit eating grin on her face. You would have to like turn fucking Julia over so you didn't see her face. <laughs> like, <'cause, fuck. laughs> because looking, I'm looking at her picture right now in the poster as she's looking lovingly with that glossy smile. I would, I would have to turn her over. Or maybe she's a freak. You know, sometimes nice girls are freaks. Uh, that's it, it, very rare. That's a that's a myth. You can't look at a girl and judge exactly how she'll be in bed. A girl who answers the door in her underwear with '80s hair and a Van Halen T-shirt, she's gonna be good in bed. But she will leave you at the altar. So it's all right. But Gene, to your point, Linda's waiting for Robbie when he comes home at night. He's drunk. He's emotionally desperate. He's lonely. And he says, I don't want to be alone anymore. They head inside together. Can we agree that Linda at least blew Robbie? That Robbie got oral sex at least. I don't know what awesome fucking fantasy world you're living in, Big D, where a dude can pass out and get a blowjob in his sister's basement. But no. Yeah. I want to live your life, Big D. Is this what happens? You, you come home, you pass out, and you get a blowjob? But you don't think he's been so lonely, so hurt. You don't think he fucking rallies up. He drinks a couple bottles of water. So he, he gets going. He's got Linda back. You don't think he fucking rallies up? No, no he's Robbie. He oh, just, uh, that's true. He probably cuddled. You're 100% correct. Robbie. Maybe he cried. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He cried, talked about Julia, and just like went to sleep like in like a ball, curled up. Yeah. He was the little spoon. There was no zippity do. No, no zippity do. <laughs> Well, after shaking off his hangover from the previous night, Robbie rejects Linda's reconciliation and kicks her out. At the 50th wedding anniversary party of his neighbor, Rosie, to whom he has been giving singing lessons, Robbie realizes he wants to grow old with Julia. Just then, Holly arrives and informs Robbie of Julia's encounter with Linda. So Robbie rushes to the airport and gets a first class ticket to Las Vegas. So you guys were talking earlier about how there's like random moments in this movie that are funny. And for me, one of the funniest gags of the whole movie is when he's checking out and the flight attendant looks at him and says, hey, do you like flock of seagulls? And he goes, no, but I see that you do, you know, because he's got that crazy ass hair. And it's so funny. It's this great sight gag. And then the Billy Idol thing I also thought was really well done in this movie. I, I think that it's almost like they let Sandler have from the anniversary party through the rest of the film because the way it's paced like the way that the jokes run it just makes sense and I also appreciate they didn't use some of that weird ass like CGI to try to make Billy Idol look like young Billy Idol again because he looks old as shit in this no. movie yes he does I thought Billy looked great, looked great. when he looks old but I will agree that, that jokes like that flock of seagulls gag are old Sandler. These are the classic like non sequiturs that we're used to. I'll never forget that, that moment in Billy Madison where the clown like comes back into the movie. He's like, hey, kids, it's me. I bet you thought I was dead. But when I fell over, I just broke my leg and got a hemorrhage in my head. Like, it's, it's fucking great. And it has nothing to do with the plot progression. It has nothing to do with anything else. It's just a fucking funny moment. And you compare that to like. Rosie, the most tired joke that I'm so glad movies have stopped doing is, did an old person just say that? Wow. You know, and so Ro- <laughs> Rosie's like talking about sex or she's rapping. Oh, yeah. Cut that shit out of this movie. <laughs> Clearly, you have not seen Grown Ups 1, 2, and 3 if you think that Adam Sandler has stopped with the old people joke. I, I have not. not. That no, is true. No. After telling a story to his empathetic fellow passengers, including Billy Idol, Robbie learns that Glenn and Julia are on the same flight. He sings a song he has written called Grow Old With You, dedicated to Julia. Glenn tries to assault Robbie, only to be shoved into a lavatory by the flight crew and passengers. Robbie and Julia admit their love for each other and share a kiss. And Billy Idol, impressed by Robbie's song, offers to tell his record company executives about Robbie. Later, Robbie and Julia are married, and Robbie's bandmates perform at their wedding. So, Ash, you know, you so eloquently before discussed that... uh, 
you know, the, the difference between comedy and romantic comedy. And I, I don't judge anyone for the type of movies they like. Vanessa loves romantic comedies. She loves the Hallmark movies. Oh, God. Come around the holiday time. It could be Christmas, Santa, Love Lost, like all the different movies that are the same thing. Is that the same and, movie? Well, it's, it's like, you know, like, uh, let's just like, like where somebody's like a princess and they find love or whatever. But the romantic <laughs> comedy, it's just, it's not for me. And as I'm watching the film, I can start to pick out all of the tropes and they bother me because again they're not meant for me but in all the romantic films that we've done you know you spot them okay we got the oh friends to lovers yep we got that one okay check the box oh second chances yep mm -hmm. let's check that forced proximity i'll help you plan the wedding but i really love you okay check uh we got the belated love epiphany oh i really do love julia these are great some of my favorites but the one that i fucking hate and just i i immediately almost have to turn the movie off is the rush to the airport it's not funny. Every 80s movie did it. So I know now that's why they put it in this movie because it's hearkening back to the 80s. But I don't want to see people running to the airport, going through security, buying a ticket. It's fucking tired. Please, please stop doing it. And thankfully, the wedding singer did not do my least favorite at all. The, the you've changed trope where somebody comes to a realization. Thank God that Robbie didn't get a job in the city. I like the fact that he stayed true, that he's a loser who will continue to live in the basement and probably make Julia miserable and make her life worse. But the cliches, they got to stop. I should expect no less from a person so disgusted by romance that he refers to women as meals. But Big D, I don't think you have to worry about uh, these airplane scenes anymore because there's text messaging. He would just text her and be like, uh, Julia, don't, don't get on the plane. I love you. And then he could just casually get to the airport and wait outside of the uh, TSA section until she came over and said hi to him. They go to Starbucks. Unless she put it in airplane mode. Right. Or <laughs> unless he leaves his like charger at home or there's a storm that knocks out all cell towers. <laughs> They'll find a way to do it, dude. They're going to find a way. Well, I'm going to hard disagree on your point, Big D, because one thing I've learned from watching hundreds of 80s and 90s movies, most movies have a better first half than a second half, and very few stick the landing. Think of all the movies we've covered, and almost invariably, they just eke out an ending. The ending is one thing that The Wedding Singer gets right. Uh, from that frantic race to the airport, to Robbie Hart experiencing first class for the first time, again, Ash, classic Adam Sandler, you called it, to the Billy Idol cameo, to the in-flight action, to the strangely satisfying and romantic grow old with you. This movie really saves the best for last, and I cannot stress how difficult that is and how many movies cannot accomplish this. Yeah, it's, it's charming in a way that I don't think that you expect from his movies. And again, hey, romantic comedies but even i like the ending scene you know the song is really lame but it's also really cute it sounds the thing i like the most about it is it sounds like a song that somebody writes in the car on the way to the airport like it doesn't sound fully fleshed out it's just like one of those cheesy songs that somebody writes you because they want to you know tell you that they love you and drew barrymore's got a little misty eyes and even i kind of go oh okay i can take this and the billy idols there what's better than that they're perfect Perfect for each other, these two. They are. Two fucking bowls of vanilla ice cream. That sounds delicious. Melted bowls. Which makes one delicious bowl of vanilla ice cream because ice cream is always better when it's slightly melted. But one of my favorite things about this movie is the throwback joke at the end to the beginning with Steve Buscemi. And he's in there and he's singing. He's in that hideous yellow suit. And he does that whole Robbie and Julia. No. Uh -uh. Like, it's so sweet. Stupid, but it's so genius, and I laughed my ass off as the credits started rolling. Oh, Ash, I hope I don't offend you here. I think that was the laziest part in the film. To me, it felt like an add-on, like the movie had just run out of steam. After we get the proposal on the airplane, oh, it's Billy Idol. We get Gene's least favorite thing in the world, besides an arsenal loss, is a group ensemble. We get Steve Buscemi. Let's bring him back. He's oh, he's now a wedding singer. And let's get every fucking wacky character to show up at the wedding. They got the old drunk in a suit. Why is he up on stage? Is he a best man? Is he part of the wedding party? And they fucking seal it with a freeze frame, like almost like slow motion, like Julia and fucking Robbie together. It should have been we get to the wedding and it's Billy. Billy Idol is playing the wedding. I would have been okay with that. No, the freeze frame, though, is clearly like a throwback to like all the 80s romance freeze frames, like in 16 Candles, like in Breakfast Club. Mm. I mean, I think the cheesy ass freeze frame is like highly intentional here. 
Gene, what do you think of the ensemble? My vision of any afterlife, if there is one, is just an ensemble ending to my life. And so I get goosies every time I see an ensemble ending. I loved it. Loved it. <laughs> Loved it. Now it's time in the podcast we give our wipe scores for the wedding singers. The wipe scores are our way of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get out of perspective. Bum, Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is pulling up to the club in your DeLorean DMC-12 blasting the Miami Vice theme song. And Five Wipes is a terrible movie. It is being the studliest kid at a bar mitzvah and getting a pity dance in front of all the other kids. Ash, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for The Wedding Singer? As a vertically challenged woman i've always despised the word cute because that's what a lot of short girls get called as women and you're so cute because we're like pocket sized so i hate that word but i can't think of a better word to use for this movie it's it's cute it was cute in 98 it's still cute today i didn't mind watching it i think as far as romantic comedies go it's pretty precious and more than anything this is actually one of the few adam sandler films that i can watch with my mom so there's like this one, there's 50 First Dates, and there's that awful movie Blended, there's that movie Spanglish. Like this really was the transition of Adam Sandler from like debauchery of my youth to like Sandler for Moms. And it's the best of the Sandler for Moms films. So they're a nice pair, very more in Sandler. I think their chemistry is natural. I think this is a better than average film. I think it's two wipes. Ash, I'm right there with you on the two wipes. I gave Happy Gilmore half a wipe. And I'm confident that Billy Madison and the water boy would land somewhere in that rarefied air. But this is not Adam Sandler's best. It's kind of mean. It's intensely predictable. And it's not particularly well written. Thankfully, there are a few bright moments, mostly from John Lovitz and Steve Buscemi, and some truly talented comedic actors that made the movie better than average, but just slightly better than average. It's two wipes for me. Happy Gilmore, I gave half a wipe. I thought it was really good. So this isn't Adam Sandler hate. I just don't know who it was who came up with the idea. Let's let's make Adam Sandler a romantic lead. This was their first attempt at it. I think they got better with time. My memory of Fifty First Dates, again with Drew Barrymore, I remember is a better film. Uh, I, I don't know. I feel guilty. But you know what? This movie wasn't made for me. If I took a date with me to see this, I probably would have said, oh, this is cute. This is something you don't have to think too much watching. It's not offensive. It's not a typical dumb romantic comedy in other reasons. Like it's a real romance. It's an average film. It had a good cast. There are some shining moments and the shining moments are the ones we remember. But for me, I can't do anything better than 2.5 wipes. You know, it's it's vanilla ice cream, but it's haagen at least. You know, it's a good vanilla. It's a good quality. It's not Publix or, you know, a 7-Eleven version. So it's a... Uh, 2.5 white. Makes sense. I'm astounded by your knowledge of vanilla ice cream options. Yeah, the Hagen does. It's a good quality vanilla. You'd be like, hmm, this was tasty. I wish I had some sprinkles or some some M&Ms or gummy bears or some some a topping. Maybe like, a, like the hard shell, you know, the one you put on and it freezes. All right. Well, two wipes from Ash, two wipes from me, and two and a half wipes from Big D. That gives us an average wipe score of 2.1, six repeating wipes for The Wedding Singer. With a score of 2.16 repeating wipes, and now ties this in the 132 spot with a whole bunch of films, Home Alone, Major League, The Goonies, Under Siege, The Sandlot, From Dust Till Dawn, The Usual Suspects, and A League of Its Own. Surprising group of films. I'm sorry, The Sandlot is a much better film than this. Yeah, I think most of them are much better films. I'm not the one who gave it a two. Nah, there, there's a common thread with all these movies, and they're all just like a... All right, movies. I love The Sandlot. All these movies, what you think about the film are the few moments. Ooh, I'm Kaiser Slose. It's so say. <laughs> it is not Slose. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Ooh, I'm Kaiser Slose. <laughs> you, got, you got Kevin McAllister. You got fucking Sloth and the Goonies. You, you know, all of these movies. You remember the dog in Sandlot. You know, it's no crying in baseball. You don't remember the whole film. You remember the moments. Sexual assault. Oh, my God. In the Sandlot. No, that's oh, a great movie. He had courage. I, I admire him. Uh, so, Gene, this week we have one quick voicemail that I wanted to share with you. Uh, it is in reference to last week's podcast review of Blood In, Blood Out, which was really polarizing with our audience. The people who had seen it 
We're happy we did it. The people who had not seen it complained that we're doing obscure movies again. Oh my God. But I misspoke about one of the actors in it. And the actor, Vin Rames, called us in to, uh, to discuss my slip up. Jack Crew, this is Vin Rames. You might not recognize my voice. I have a cold. <laughs> Listen. I'm not real familiar with what you do, but my friend Gabriel Byrne tipped me off about something. I guess you've had a little run-in with him, too. So uh, I listened to your Blood In, Blood Out episode and was real surprised to learn that I died. <laughs> I feel pretty good, so maybe it's a sixth sense situation. But then again, I've been filming shit as recently as this week, so I have my doubts. But <laughs> about 20 minutes in to the Blood In, Blood Out episode, Big D said... Unfortunately, the late Ving Rames, blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm not sure if you were thinking of Michael Clark Duncan or what, you racist mother. I'm just kidding, man. You said some nice things about the movie, so I'm going to let it slide. Uh, just here to tell you, I'm still with you. To be perfectly honest, I'm going to outlive all of you. You know how I know? Because I filmed eight Mission Impossible movies with Tom Cruise. He personally introduced me to those aliens he worships. I made a donation, and... Me and Tom get to make those movies forever, man. Why do you think he does that crazy shit? Motherfucker's fearless for a reason. He ain't going nowhere. You know that when I was only in for that one scene, I didn't even get paid for that shit. I went right to the aliens. Anyway, just letting you know, you don't have to mourn old thingy. And just because I get $30 every time I say it, Arby's, we have the meats. Oh, and uh, by the way, you guys got the burbs all wrong. But thanks for the nice words on my movie, man. Later. So we got a message, well, several <laughs> messages about this, but on one of them, it was like, did you know that Ving Rhames didn't die? And I'm such a cocky fuck that I wrote back, Big D confuses people all the time. He must have had Ving Rhames confused with Delroy Lindo, oh, no. who's in Blood In, Blood Out. Lindo is very much alive. To which then they wrote back and said, no, Ving Rhames is also in this movie. I don't think it's racist because I will mix up every single race of people. Like even in this movie, I could have sworn I thought that that Benjamin Pratt was in La Bamba. But no, that's Lou Diamond Phillips. I confuse people all the time. Uh, it's nothing to do with race. It's just me being slow in the head. Do you get white people confused with each other? Oh, sure. Yeah, white people all look alike. Give me an example. Quick, it, quick. Uh, he, well, Name uh, one time you got white people mixed up on this podcast. Uh, I, I've been confused in brown any... people. Black no, people. Lou Diamond Phillips isn't brown. You know, I've had two of my cousins on this podcast before, and you didn't even notice. You thought it was me. Oh, that's yeah, that would be funny. It's so stupid. Yeah. They don't even speak English. What the fuck? He won't even mind me going to the wedding, then, right? Me and Beebs, <laughs> we can fucking do a duet. Any of you guys been to a wedding with more than three hundred people? Hopefully, I will. Big D, maybe I can get I can slip you under the night before party. There's a, it's at a farm. Are you, uh, dude? I'll do anything. You dress you up as a horse. I will fucking throw on a ghillie suit and low crawl across <laughs> the fucking hills. I'll do whatever you want to get me in there. We could make a Mission Impossible. Like you could get a little radio, I'll get an earpiece, yeah. and you could navigate as I get onto the farm. Oh, please! I'll ask my auntie if it's okay. She's she's in town today. I'll ask her if it's okay. All right, that's it for this week. What do we have coming up next week? Well, Gene, next week, I'm really excited. We're going to be reviewing the film version of one of the three books I've read in my life. When creepy old man named Leland Gaunt moves into a small town in Maine to set up an antique shop, bad things soon follow. Gaunt has a remarkable ability of selling people exactly what they most want. But his ideal purchase comes with a price that involves more than just money. Though Gaunt manipulates the citizens of the town gradually, they turn on one another, resulting in violence that the sheriff, Alan Pangborn, struggles to contain. This was commissioned by Lisa C., and it was released in 1993, and I am excited to rewatch this one. Back to you, Gene. Thank you, Lisa, for your commission of the upcoming movie, and thank you, Steve, for your many, many commissions, and thank you to all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at ShatTheMovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or by commissioning your own movie. You can find all that information by visiting our website, ShatPod.com. Also, check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, Watchmen, and don't forget, Season 4 of Westworld is coming up, so get caught up on all our previous seasons and get ready for the next one. Don't forget to subscribe to that. You can find all our information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV. Wherever we find podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube, be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review. 
that helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-host, Ash and Big D, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. Castle Rock Entertainment and Stephen King invite you to visit Castle Rock, Maine, a quiet little town whose population has just increased by one. Do you believe in the devil, Father? I guess I have to. You can't have one without the other. What's he look like? What the hell does he look like? May I take this opportunity to welcome you to Castle Rock on the good Lord's behalf? Why not? So where are you from? Ohio. I've been in this business a long time, and I've learned the pleasure of offering my customers what they really need. He came here to destroy us. Oh, you wish it. There have been two murders and an attempted suicide in this quiet little town, and Mr. Leland Gorn is at the bottom of it. You are disgusting. I like that in a person. Everybody that's got it coming is going to get it now. The young carpenter from Nazareth. I knew him well. Promising young man. But he died badly. A famine here, a flood there, a little bloodlash, a broken heart. You can't win. I've got God on my side. I killed my wife. Is that wrong? Hey, these things happen. Robbie Hart is a New Jersey wedding singer in 1985. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity, too. I was trying so hard not. Right. <laughs> Why'd you have to do that? That's going to be in my head. That was the only thing I can remember I know, him but doing. but it's now all I hear in my head is... <laughs> <laughs>